Hi, I'm Nicholas Cage. I'm here with director Neil LeBute on Movie Phones Unscripted, and we're going to be asking each other some of your questions as well as our own. Let's start with the first question. Was it a challenge to write, direct, remake a, a cult classic? Did you receive any flack from the fans of the original? Always a challenge to make a movie, whether it's a remake or something that's new out of your head. I think with this movie, this is one that people either know very well, intimately, and are in fact a kind of cult fans of, or they have no idea what the movie is. And those people who do know it, they come in with very pointed feelings about how they feel about the original and even the idea of somebody remaking it. So I think you, you walk in with that burden on your shoulders. Don't you feel that in some ways, even though we're recreating in another direction, it's still an homage to the original? Oh, absolutely. I, yeah. think, I think you can follow the trajectory of the, of the story and, and the journey that, that the policeman, in your case, Edward Malus, but in the original, uh, Neil Howey, takes, you can, you can see direct lifts from, from scenes, and the journey is the same, the idea of saving a little girl, but, but our, the way in which we get there, the path is quite different. Her name is Rowan. She has been missing for two weeks now. I fear she is in danger, so now I turn to you. Be careful and believe nothing that you see or hear. Question for you. Now, you must get offered a countless number of roles. Right. Why, do you why did you choose to do The Wicker Man? It was a personal reason to begin with. My friend, uh, a punk rocker, Johnny Ramone, who's no longer with us, uh, was a huge fan of, uh, of horror films. And I would go to his house, and we would watch his favorite movies. And he had a list of ones that I had never seen. And he mentioned The Wicker Man, and I was aware of it because I'd seen the poster for it when I was a boy. But mysteriously, the movie never really uh, came out, or I, 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 I didn't have access to it. And I watched the film with Johnny, and I was uh, profoundly affected, uh, especially by the end of the movie. And so I thought to myself, well, wouldn't it be interesting to kind of bring this back? Uh, not too many people I know are aware of it. Wasn't there also a, a point, even when close to his death, that he asked you again about the, the, the movie? He was in the hospital, and, he, uh, and, and I think what was not unlike a, a haze, he, he asked about The Wicker Man, is, is Nick doing The Wicker Man? So Which, in fact, we dedicated at the end of the movie um, for Johnny yeah, Ramone. Yeah, so if you, if you stick with us through the movie, you'll see for Johnny Ramone at the end. Now, this is not my question. This is coming from one of the people on the Internet. Why is Nicolas Cage the ideal hero? <laughs> yes! <laughs> Why is Nicolas Cage the ideal hero? Good luck. I don't know how to answer that. There's the equivalency of what we call a modern hero. You know, rather than, say, Greek tragedy. The tragic hero in, in, in literature had to be, you know, someone who was a king of royal descent. So that an audience would watch that figure and, and have this cathartic experience, which was, if that person can fall, imagine what could happen to me. And I think that in a way that actors, movie stars, have replaced that kind of idea for us today. You bring in all the elements of a, of a star, to this part, but you're also someone that people can identify with. They've seen you play leading men, they've seen you play character parts. People can very easily say, he is me, I can experience this, you know, through his eyes. I think that people identify with you in a way today that makes it heroic for them. They believe that they can overcome the same kinds of obstacles. So that's why I think you have such a close connection with an audience. This is an unscripted question from me. Okay. How you doing? I'm good. <laughs> Could you feel it? Here's a real unscripted question. Think of another film from the past that you've enjoyed. Is there one that jumps out to you that you go, I'd love to remake this, or I would have loved to have been in that one? Yeah, I think that, you know, I've often wanted to do another version of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. as really? Captain Nemo I thought would be fantastic. To play Captain Nemo? To play Captain Nemo. I think there's room there to try something. Uh, enthusiasm about the ocean. It does go beyond that, and more and more I'm noticing now that my personal life is interfacing with my work. Uh, I'm bringing more and more of my own passions and interests into the work itself. It's working for me in that I, th I find it's becoming more and more honest. But I think that there could be like a zealousness to that role which, which I would like to contribute. I want to be genuinely thrilled when I'm showing people specimens of the ocean and, and, and that I can make a cigarette out of seaweed. And you know, this is, yeah, I think it would be a lot of fun. Oh, well, this is an, actually a good question. How are you able to make a creepy, scary movie that takes place mainly in the daytime? When one is on a, a kind of police procedural, 
it makes it, you don't go knocking on doors in the middle of the night. You, you go to people's homes when you think they're there and awake and all of that. There's more of a sense of unsettling creepiness that comes yeah. into this movie. It's the same sort of thing that you look at how Kubrick did in, in The Shining. Yeah. He spends most of the time in a, in a hotel that's rather well lit and big rooms. There's, you know, sometimes the scariest things are what you can see, yeah. not what's hiding behind a door. It's like a misdirection. It's happening in the daylight. How can this? Be? How, how can things? How can things go wrong? Things can go very wrong. Yeah. You know, if you see something that you don't like, and then you can't get away from, it. because of course you can't hide in the dark either. Yeah. A philosopher once said, "Where the sun is the brightest, the shadows are the darkest." Lost your bearings? Oh, hey. Sorry. Snuck up on me there. This is private property. Do you know her? Hmm. I don't recognize this child. Welcome. Here's another question. If you're flipping channels and a film from early in your career comes on, do you watch? Also, do you get nostalgic or judgmental if you happen to watch that? It depends really upon my mood. Uh, generally, uh, I shut it off, and, or my, my wife will tune in a little bit and I'll ask her to shut it off politely. But, but there are times when it becomes like a photo album and it's a trip down memory lane. And you think about that day you shot that scene. It's or, as much about the experience yeah, as it is about the finished product. Yeah, and the people that you worked with, and, oh, it's, you know, he, he's no longer with us, or that's nice to see his face again, or that yeah. kind of thing. They want you to ask me something unscripted. Well, hell, I just did that. <laughs> <laughs> How many unscripted questions could I have? Um, well, you write pretty good scripts. So. All right, so what's the process for you to go from one character to another? How do you personally make the transition and still be a you know, person who can come home and be Nick Cage? I've had a lot of people ask me, why do I work as much as I do? And the reason is I like to be active. I, I am an actor with the underline of act. I want to. I want to act. I want to be active in my life and the things I want to uh, uh, help out with. And I want to be active in my work. I'm into creating. I feel I've only got so much time uh, in this physicality, and I want to take advantage of it as much as I can and be productive. I've been doing it for 25 years now and I've learned how to compartmentalize. It's no longer necessary for me to 100% live the part uh, as I used to do when I was 17 with heroes like Robert De Niro who you would hear these stories were method actors. You take some element, some sense of that, but you don't, I don't feel I, I need to do that. So I've been able to multitask and think about other characters while working on other characters by going into that compartment. So it's just a matter of literally saying, okay, now I'm going into Wicker Man compartment, and then I'm going home and I'm learning the accent for World Trade Center, so that's that compartment. And you, it's just about being very quick about shutting things on and shutting things off. Thank you to Movie Phone, and, and thanking, for, thanking you for watching us and sending in your questions, and we hope that we answered you favorably. Thank you. I'm gonna get applause after that. Yeah. It's like a TV show. Yes! <laughs> what does this mean to you? <laughs>